Thank you for joining us for this evening's presentation. We look forward to you joining us for upcoming programs. Stay tuned for more information regarding our culminating celebration. For questions regarding the content and details of the ongoing program, please contact Elaine Mattingly gwcf at windstream.net and for questions regarding registration, Zoom links, and accessing online videos, please contact Meredith Crawford, crawfordm at crlibrary.org. 23 Grantwood Country Forum, thank you all for being here. And a uh, special thanks to the Cedar Rapids Public Library, the Anamosa Library and Learning Center, Cedar Rapids Museum of Art, Iowa Poetry Association. We're so happy to have your organizational partnership with us. Um, it just means so much. And uh, especially with the two libraries working together, really covering a lot of Grantwood territory, uh, literally. Uh, for tonight's session, we, we are welcome in introducing the series where we're finding out how to find Grant Wood at uh, the Cedar Rapids Public Library this evening and maybe in one of the future sessions with, uh, with uh, Anamosa, what kind of the resources they have. Um, then with Don Terpstra, president of the Iowa Poetry Association and also a prolific and a wonderful poet she she writer she will give us tips and tricks for unlocking your grantwood writing inspirations this is built into the series and then i'm going to aspire to give a jumping off point kind of for sending you off in all many directions uh this forum exploring some things related to grantwood in particular uh some of our sessions are um are, are related to uh, women in Grant Wood's life. And so kind of centered a little bit, some on that, not totally. Um, the other thing we want, I want to do is give a shout out to, um, and I want to give a shout out to Meredith, she's the Community Engagement Library, Cedar Rapids Public Library, and to Aaron Rush, the director of the Anamosa Library and Learning Center, and to Sh Sean, he'll be in a future uh, session, Omar, the executive director of Cedar Rapids Museum of Art, uh, uh, Kari Nicely is the director of the American Gothic House and Center, and so that's new, so it'll be fun to have her with us, uh, not this evening, but throughout the series, and then Don will be popping in uh, most sessions to help guide the writing and uh, and also one of the things that um, I would love for people to know is that this is an enthusiasts driven series and we make this series available to everyone for no fee and people donate their expertise talents and time to this effort um, and those people include Joe Coffey uh, uh, of Grantwood Stories fame and, and much other fame in the Cedar Rapids area. Barbara Feller, author of two going on three Grantwood related books. Steve Hanks, uh, rural life and man about town and archeology span and ba the barn, uh, Iowa archeology span uh, background as well as uh, Iowa Barn Foundation. Um, That's Hankin. What did I say? Oh, That's it's a typo. Hankin. It is Hankin. Why did I? Well, there we go. There's my first typo on my slides. It was bound to happen. Um, Paul C. Jewell, he'll author of several uh, uh, Grantwood related books, and he'll be with us. Uh, in one of the uh, sessions featuring the appraisal artwork. 
uh, myself, as well as Dorothy Bunny Montgomery. She'll be working with Paul on one of the sessions, and she's the author of a historical fiction book. And Dorothy and I um, share a background from, we were uh, born and raised in the Anamosa area. Uh, Sylvia Popelka from uh, Cedar Rapids here. She's hopping on to be a presenter this year. We're so excited to have her working on Daughters of Revolution, among other things, and Dawn with the, um, the writing. Um, so what is the Grantwood Country Forum? I just want to make sure everybody understands that we're trying, we are trying to do a lot of things, but I think it's part of our strength. We're trying to do art appreciation related to Grant Wood's many artworks, and he does artworks in, in different uh, mediums. Um, uh, part history and cultural exploration. So we go beyond the man and his art. We, we delve into his life and times and impact and ongoing influence. Um, and on purpose, we build in time to have conversations and do some connection community building because it's one of the delights is finding where each other's paths and interests intersect. Um, and we're part document, document, documentation of our unique forum for voices in the form of the annual Grantwood Country Chronicle publication, which embodies poetry, short fiction, and essays as our culminating project. Um, and so this year we'll have Kathy Rickers from Newton and uh, helping us with the graphic design. And Don's gonna help with the editing. And what you can do regarding the writing is it is for any level of engage, any level of writing. Don't, what the important thing is, is we wanna capture your voice. So don't worry about the details too much. You don't have to write a poem. You don't have to write an essay. You don't have to write short fiction. You could just just say something, and we want to get capture your voice and your experience and your thoughts related to this forum, um, and and so that it speaks to the authenticity of this experience in the valley of Grantwood Country. So, um, so please please uh, reach out if you have any questions about how. I'll, well, that might work. And I don't know if most of you saw the lineup, but it's pretty, I'm pretty excited about this lineup this year. It's just really a lot of fun. And so I want to make sure that you know that there's not a session tomorrow, uh, next Monday because it's MLK Day. Um, and I don't know if there, Meredith, if you might be able to let a couple people in. I'm not able, my cursor won't let me let folks in. Um, I'm no longer the there. host is the problem. Oh, so maybe what I need to do is, yeah, it's not, it's not, my cursor's not letting me do it. So here, here we go. I'll go back to, there we go. Got him in that way. Just kind of have to shift back and forth here a little bit is all. I'm seeing that. Okay, so so next Monday. So actually, related to the, all the writing, you you could literally start writing and submitting things after this session if you are so inclined and inspired. On the twenty third, uh, we're going to have Grant Wood from Farm Boy to American Icon with Sean Ulmer of the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art, um, piggybacking with. Um, site director uh, Kari Nicely of the American Gothic House in Eldon, which I think is just going to be a really neat pairing. So that's going to be very interesting. Um, Monday the 30th, uh, Steve Hankin, aka Hanks, no I'm teasing, um, <laughs> <laughs> Steve Hankin is going to regale us with thoughts about rural life in the con in context during the Grant Wood era. And he definitely has a lot of insights and a lot to say. So I'm excited about that. And in kind of a complimentary vein, we're excited to have Joe do, Joe Coffey doing a um, session this year, presentation this, this series 
about city life during the Grantwood era. And we know that he'll he'll pull some nuggets that are gonna be very interesting uh, for us to experience and inspirational, I'm sure. And then on Monday the 13th, women's work, quote unquote, in the Grantwood era with Sylvia and Barbara Fowler, Sylvia Papalka and Barbara Fowler. Um, very excited to have them uh, really trying to share with us maybe what kind of the social life was like what were like what were the lives of women like in Grantwood in, in the area Grantwood um, and lived uh, and during his life so get give us some context on that and then we'll essentially end the series with our artwork explorations featuring featuring um, featuring um, uh, daughters of revel daughters of revolution and um the appraisal so i'm very excited that those are going to be really interesting discussions but well this is dawn and i'm just uh really thrilled uh to be participating in the series this year uh elaine shared with me the plans and it just sounds like a, a very very exciting line up and uh, there's, I'm just thrilled. There's so much information to work with. And I know that your creative work will be uh, absolutely inspired. But I wanted to mention to you all that uh, Lyrical Iowa, which is part of the Iowa Poetry Associations, uh, it's, it's an annual anthology that we put out. Um, and uh, by the way, uh, Iowa Poetry Association is over 77 years old. So we, we have our we have deep roots roots in uh, Grant Wood country for sure. And this year we have a contest that replaces our ekphrastic poetry contest, which was new last year. It's, it's actually, it's still an ekphrastic category, but it's called the Grant Wood uh, Country uh, Prize. And it's for a poem about any of Grant Wood's works. And I'm going to turn it over to Marilyn. I saw she was on. And Marilyn, I hope I'm not putting you on the spot, but I, I know oh, that no. you enjoy <laughs> You love talking about, <laughs> about this. Topic. Oh, I just love talking. You know that. So <laughs> I'm happy to share a little bit about our contest. I, I am excited. We've been doing this for these many years that, you know, this 77 years that we've been doing the contest. And um, it has, uh, I call it a competition, and it covers a number of contests in the adult categories, and we also have uh, divisions for the students. And in the adults, we have general categories, we've got categories for traditional forms, but we have this exciting ekphrastic category, which is now uh, being taken over, if you will, by the Grantwood Country um, poetry contest. And so that's the exciting thing about uh, the connection here. And we're inviting all of you, uh, if you write any kind of poetry at all, you, you can submit to this contest because it is open to any form, uh, any style about any work of Grant Wood. And so um, that's what makes this kind of an exciting connection this year. Um, the only real hard rule, if we, if you will, that we have for this is that there's a 20 line limit. And that actually goes for all of our contests. So you've got to squeeze it into 20 lines, although you may want to write an awful lot more, that's okay, but not for our contest. I'll be sending it back to you and say, nope, you've got to shorten that 20 lines, that's it. Um, but we are excited about it. And uh, so um, our contest is described in detail on our website, iowapoetry.com. You can find the links there or, sorry, um, iowapoetry.com um, uh, and just click on the Lyrical Iowa competition though, that'll take you to the rules. So. Um, but our, we're excited to have that. And also the judge for that category is Tim Faye, a name some of you might recognize. So that should be interesting as well. Yeah, and the only thing too to mention is that the contest closes February 28th. Yes, it's open now. Thank you. I, um, that, that also, and we do 
uh, prefer email submissions if that's at all possible. But again, it'll, you'll find all that in the rules. February 28th is the deadline. So um, that uh, it kind of comes up quickly, but um, this is the perfect place to be working on them. So yeah. Oh, and you can submit up to five poems. You can submit up to five poems in that contest or however you want to spread it out. So. <laughs> And, okay, so what do we got going here? All right. So, um, did you did you mention that that contest was for Iowa? Was for Iowans? You had you you, you need be, need to be an Iowan to live in oh, Iowa. Sorry. Yeah, contest? I didn't think to mention that. No, you're you're right. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, Okay. We, we do have only one requirement, um, is that you must have an Iowa address. Um, you can be a student going to an Iowa school or someone um, in Iowa going to school elsewhere or working elsewhere, but there must be that Iowa residence or a residency requirement. Thank right. you. And, and, and what, the, what the alternative is from Editor's Choice Awards, that we're establishing this year. And that's open to anyone across the country. And so Don and I will work together to feature some of this. And that could be poetry, short fiction, or the essays. We'll come up with a combination of those that we'll feature in this year's Grantwood Country Chronicle. So that is open uh, to everyone. So basically, if you submit something to the Grantwood Country Chronicle, you will be in consideration. So, thank you, Dawn, so much. What I wanted to bring to the table this evening was just a little bit about what resources the library, the Cedar Rapids Public Library has to offer. So off the bat, I think you've all figured out that I am the person that holds the keys to the email that comes from the library. We've sussed out some of our um, registration problems. There will be more, I am sure. But for whatever it's worth, um, there are a couple extra things that, and I can drop my, I'll say too, I'll drop my email in the chat after I close out this presentation so you can contact me if for some reason the email that you received from me today wasn't enough. But from the, the Cedar Rapids Public Library's website, if you registered for the event, you were able to find this page. Just as a reminder, when you click on the event, you'll see the long explanation, which also includes all of the different presentations that are coming up, if you need to go back and access that. Um, let's see. One of the things that we have to offer is an archive of videos that our programming department has made over the last pandemic years. We've discovered that we could do some online programming. Um, and so one of those programs that we have to offer is the Complete Grantwood Writers Forum from last year. So there's a playlist. Um, there's a link to that playlist in the content of the event on our events calendar. And for what it's worth, as you see on the side here, those are all of the episodes from last year. Um, after this evening's meeting closes out tomorrow morning. I'll download the video and then I'll edit it. And then this will be the place where all of the Grantwood Writers Forums come to. Um, additionally, we did a series of programs called Get Lost in Iowa. This one happens to be all about Grantwood and our programming librarians, Jen and Molly put this together. And it's kind of a nice little video. It's short, it's about 10 minutes plus of content, but that's a kind of interesting tidbit for all of you fans of Grant Wood Country out there. Additionally, for our 125th anniversary, we dug into our archives quite literally and were able to create a video that discussed art in the library and Grant Wood was a very important part of that. Um, this is a section of one of those videos that Jen had put together. Um, and while we were looking for some of these treasures, we found in our archives, I'll pop this out. 
pages and pages of documentation about original works of art of Grant Woods that were on display at the library or whether it was relationships between the former Cedar Rapids Public Library, which is now part of the Cedar Rapids Art Museum. So there are a lot of interesting things that came out of our research um, for our anniversary celebration. Additionally, for those of you that don't know, through our library's website, you can access a multitude of online resources. You don't have to have a Cedar Rapids Public Library card to access all of these. And one of my favorites is right here, this digital archive. When you click on that, it'll take you to an interface where you can search Cedar Rapids historic newspapers going back to the 1800s. But it's just kind of an interesting walk through time. You'll see here, this is the Cedar Rapids Gazette um, the day after Grant Wood died. And there's multiple pages of information here. An article from August 11th, 1946 about a Carnegie grant in effect that brought a lot of different art to the Cedar Rapids area. And it discussed, as you can see, artists in Stone City and the artist colony. And then additionally, here's just another something that I pulled that had some interesting graphics along with it, but a Gazette article from 1942 as well, later in the year. It goes on to talk about, you know, not just Grant Wood and his work, but a small excerpt at the bottom there about art at the public library. Um, that's the long and the short of library resources, except for those good old fashioned books. Elaine had referenced the Grant Wood Country Chronicle. This is the 2022 edition. And there, we have two copies of these available at either branch. I actually just double checked today and um, They'll be formally cataloged and on the shelf and searchable in our online catalog within the next couple of weeks. So those are resources from the library. I'm not sure, let's see, if there's anything that anyone has questions about or any, any additional things from the library side, but I'm pretty much just your Zoom jockey to get you your links. Um, but if I can be helpful with anything, please let me know. Well, we are making it happen, everybody. Thank you all so much for your patience. What you may or may not know is that the Grantwood Country Chronicle, uh, the, every year there's a limited edition run of print copies, but there's also the digital copies that, that the uh, library is making available. So it's exciting that they have both hard copies that can be checked out and have the digital copies as well. So love that, love that, love that. What we're hoping to do with that is, um, oh, what I want to mention is that the two, 2022 edition of the, of the Chronicle, if there's anybody who's involved in this, this session that didn't get one who would like one, now that the series has started and you're participating in it, I'd be happy to send you a copy so you can see that these two copies. So it's kind of first. Um, and that actually does include both the first and second years of this forum series. So it's kind of a double, double issue in that regard. And so I wanted you to know about that. Um, as far as submitting writing for this publication, um, you can start that now, and I'll, we'll accept that throughout the entire series. And, I'll, and I'm, we've set the deadline as Sunday, March 12th, uh, midnight. So, and if you want to have, discuss your writing in any way or want some help or editorial help before you submit it, you know, feel free to reach out. Um, you can uh, submit as many pieces as you like. We will... Um, commit to making sure at least one of your pieces gets in, depending on space. And you can also include photos, um, submit those. So that's that. And uh, those submissions would go to the Grantwood, uh, GWCF, Grantwood Country Forum at windstream.net. And don't worry, you can, you can get a hold of, hold of me or whatever, um, or go to the Facebook, Grantwood Country Forum Facebook page 
and we can give you that information as well of, of, of how, how all the submissions work. So um, uh, for us, there's no line limits and there's no word limits at this point. So, um, and then we had, we had a chance to talk about the Editor's Choice Awards. And so there's kind of the, and the uh, Iowa Poetry Association Grantwood uh, Country Award. Uh, I did want to mention that our judge, Kim Fay, has received, uh, he, he edited, he spent like 25 years editing the uh, Wapsipinican Almanac. He'll be our judge, and he has received an anthology of that publication that will be coming out through University of Iowa Press. And our Steve Hankin, I believe, got one of his pieces in that anthology. So... Yay, Steve, we'll look forward to seeing that when that anthology hits the presses. So that's, a, that's really neat. Um, yep, and so I just wanted people to understand that the spirit of us doing a written project is to capture your voices and this unique thing that we're doing together. So to me, that's the most, that's the most important thing is that we're documenting what we're doing and enjoying it while we go. And you don't feel a lot of pressure uh, on the writing. It's more for, for the joy of it. Um, and then Meredith just helped us out with what, what they're doing. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and start sharing Dawn's um, uh, presentation. So are you ready, Dawn? I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. I was just let me stop sharing that. And then we'll get yours open. Find your present. Yep, there you are. Well, some of you, if you were here last year, you will recognize parts of this presentation. Uh, this was basically inspired by presenting to the forum. And then I have a uh, sense. Um, uh, I, I've actually expanded it, but this is a more condensed version. Um, I've been teaching ecrostic uh, poetry writing for uh, River Hair and Review, so that's been a lot of fun. It's been a great uh, offshoot from this. So uh, I remember last year we started out with this word ecrosis, and uh, you know, just wondering what is this? Is this a is this a skin condition? <laughs> is that <laughs> uh, no, this is uh, this means description in Greek. Uh, some of the the earliest writings, ekphrastic uh, writing, when uh, was in, or I should say, even storytelling, was uh, describing some of the great works that people who would travel uh, from, uh, who maybe they weren't a, a city dweller, maybe they lived in a village and they would go and they'd see these great pieces of art. They would spend, uh, you know, a lot of time describing in as much detail as they could remember what they saw. So that's where this tradition comes from. It's a vivid and ekphrastic poem and um, Something that's ekphrastic doesn't have to be a poem. It can be a piece of fiction. Uh, it can be even uh, creative nonfiction if you wanted to, uh, to do it that way. So it's just any kind of writing that's a vivid description of a scene or more commonly a work of art. And uh, over the years that has come to uh, expand beyond visual art. And we'll talk about that here in a moment. But through the act, of, the imaginative act of narrating and reflecting on the action of a painting or sculpture, um, the writer may amplify and expand its meaning. So that's what I, you know, where I want us to kind of start with all of this is just thinking about how do I, um, you know, just really go beyond what I see? How do I have this conversation with art? That's, that's what I always like to uh, talk about when I talk about these engagements because you you are having an engagement or a conversation with something else whether you see yourself uh, inside of that work of art or as uh, a third party observer so you, you this is this is a time when you just really start to kind of um, imagine so we're going to go on to the next slide thank you Elaine for running this for me 
Um, so this is that conversation between poetry and art or any kind of writing and art and art, again, just as it's not always visual. Um, the poet engages with art and creates a narrative to describe the encounter. Uh, and that art, it includes, as I said, visual art, but that visual art can also include photography or film. Uh, it can include, it's also other literature, including poetry or something that you read. I'm so glad to hear that the Grantwood Country uh, Chronicle is going to be, uh, there's digital access because people may read what was written last year and that may inspire them, that may prompt them to write something else. So that would, that kind of writing would be ekphrastic writing in response to somebody else's poem or essay or uh, fiction. Um, also music, movies, et cetera, uh, you name it. It can be, and performance can also be included in this as well. So I want you to think about, uh, you know, just kind of imagine that Grant Wood image in your mind, whether it's an image of a particular piece or uh, something that's more generic, or maybe you've read other things. Maybe you've read articles or something that you would, you're imagining yourself in the voice of uh, characters or object, uh, and you're going to create a dialogue or just even, you know, musings um, that would be part of this, this work that you're creating. You can also write in the voice of the artist. That is so much fun. Uh, I, my piece last year was kind of a third person omniscient view of um, kind of, you know, Grant Wood and what was going on in his head uh, as he was imagining um, right, uh, painting American Gothic. You can imagine the story behind the art. Uh, you could also directly address the artist or the subject in your piece. So really there, there are no rules except that it's about this conversation or this engagement um, between the, the writer, another piece, another work of art, and the page. So let's, let's move on. So Here's one of the most famous ones um, by John Keats. When any, anybody thinks about ecrastic uh, poetry, this is maybe the example that they turn to and it's called Ode to a Grecian Urn. And this is, um, you can see the, the image of the Grecian Urn over there uh, on the left-hand side. And um, I, I'm, I'm just gonna read the first stanza here. And again, your own writing doesn't have to be poetry, but if it was prose, you know, imagine what, what it might say. What men or gods are these? What maidens love? What mad pursuit? What struggle to escape? What pipes and timbrels? What wild ecstasy? So what's Keats describing? Anybody can unmute. I can't see anybody raising their hand. <laughs> so, if you have a thought. Well, he's describing, he's describing the images of the people that go all the way around this urn. Some of them we can't see, uh, but he's trying to describe this for somebody who has not seen this urn. And you can see Keats also sketched this urn. So uh, that's, that's really amazing. Um, and then, you know, I'm, I'm not going to read all of this, but just I want you to notice, uh, you know, just the style uh, that he's using here. And also, if if it's okay, I, I will send this to perhaps Meredith to post this presentation. It's a nice little uh, reference, but we're going to go on. We're going to go on and we're going to look at another really good example. Again, one I used last year. This is the Starry Night um, after Vincent van Gogh's uh, famous work. And this one's by Anne Sexton, a very famous poet. And uh, I will go ahead and read this. And Leslie Elaine, do you want to read this? Oh, go ahead, Dawn. Okay. Yeah. The town does not exist except where one black-haired tree slips up like a drowned woman into the hot sky. The town is silent. The night boils with 11 stars. Oh, starry, starry night. This is how I want to die. It moves. They are all alive. Even the moon bulges in its orange irons to push children like a god from its eye. The old unseen serpent swallows up the stars. Oh, starry, starry night, this is how I want to die. 
into that rushing beast of the night, sucked up by that great dragon, to split from my life with no flag, no belly, no cry. So you can see here the, the effective uh, use of a refrain, but in um, stands at the end of stanzas one and two, which is just very, it's a really effective technique. It's very simple, uh, but you can see some of the, the ways that Sexton uh, focused on the dark image, uh, the image of the one black haired tree, um, likening it to, uh, you know, a serpent, uh, that rushing beast, also the 11 stars, uh, even the moon bulges in its orange irons. Um, so there's, it, it's, it's amazing the imagery that Sexton has put into this short poem uh, and how, how well it complements this particular work of art. So, and again, this is all from her imagination. This is not, I'm going to describe this, this uh, work of art. It's not that at all. This is uh, what she chose to focus on and what story she chose to tell. And the next one. Oh, here's one by by me. Uh, this was in last, <laughs> last year's quartet uh, uh, journal and I uh, actually had another contrapuntal poem in uh, just this current edition of, of uh, quartet. But this is after uh, Excursion into Philosophy by Edward Hopper. And um, I'm going to be talking uh, in a few weeks about how to write a contrapuntal poem. Not that you need to do it. It's just I would like to bring out some forms um, because we can, you know, a lot of us who are poets, we, we're writing poetry in the way that we we enjoy writing poetry. But once in a while, it's fun to kind of challenge yourself to do something different. So a contrapuntal poem is one where um, you read the, the first stanza on the left-hand side, you go then and read the, the stanza on the right-hand side. These are like two separate poems. And then you read the, the two, you read then across uh, horizontally so that it becomes uh, a single poem. So, um, you know, it's a little bit like, uh, like doing a puzzle. Uh, putting these things together. I'm not going to read this one because it takes a, a while to read this. It's it's very short, but it's just it's a fun way. You know, the my approach to this this particular work of art was just to make up this story about this uh, very dejected looking man and the shadows and the light at his feet and imagining this this woman. I don't know if you can even see the woman behind him, but there's a a woman behind him and just imagining what this uh, relationship or this moment is like. Um, so uh, yeah, this one was the writer being engaged and immersed in the, the, the painting itself, observing closely. We'll go into the next one. Hear me? Yeah. Okay. Would it be okay if I read it? Oh, go for it. Elaine, yes, it's yes. an honor. Yes, I, I would love love to try this so left okay. side right side then across right yes uh-huh yes. at noon on the piazza a table beneath a canopy view of a fountain once he tossed a coin wishing for love he craves polenta anchovies figs a bottle of barolo yes uh, did i say that right barolo uh -huh. yes Swing right at his feet so so cool. now, now the next so one yeah Yep, he remembers the feel of fire between his fingers, a redhead with freckled calves, with nails the color of embers. She is like smoke surrendering through an open window and offering prayer from an empty temple. Shadow burns to ash. Oh, that's fun. So uh, now across we go. Yes. At noon on the piano. The piazza, he remembers, a table beneath a canopy, the feel of fire between his fingers, view of a fountain, a redhead with freckled calves, once he tossed a coin with nails the color of embers, wishing for love. She is like smoke, he craves, ah, she is like smoke, he craves, that's good, surrounding through an open window, polenta anchovies, figs, and offering a bottle of Barolo, prayer from an empty temple, sunlight at his feet shadow burns to ash that's fun that it, it, it's almost like people like puzzles you know 
it, it's totally like a puzzle. So yeah, I, and we'll talk a, more about uh, contrapuntals. It will have its own little moment uh, in the forum um, in a couple of weeks. But this is just, it's another option, something different. It's, you know, you can write whatever you want, but this is, it's just fun to learn something new. So um, yeah, let's go on to the next one. So here's one, this is called American Gothic after the painting by Grant Wood, 1930 by John Stone. John Stone was a professor of medicine. Uh, and I don't remember, it was a university out East. And this is really kind of uh, written a little bit tongue in cheek. And it's just, it's, it's a fun poem. And Lane, would you like to read this one? This is not a contrapuntal, just, you know, up and just traditionally. Would you like to read it? Oh, okay. Just oh, he's from Emory. There we go. Go ahead. Okay. Just outside the frame, there has to be a dog, chickens, cows, and hay, and a smokehouse where a ham in hickory is also being preserved. Here for all time, the borders of the Gothic window anticipate the ribs of the house, the tines of the pitchfork, repeat the triumph of his overalls in front and center, the long faces, the sober lips above the upright spines of this couple arrested in the name of art. These two by now, the sun this high, ought to be in mortal time about their business. Uh-oh, I can't see. You're gonna have to okay. read the rest of it. I will. I yeah, ought to be in mortal time about their businesses. Instead, they linger here within the patient fabric of the lives they wove, he asking the artist silently, how much longer, and worrying about the crops, she no less concerned about the crops, but more to the point just now, whether she remembered to turn off the stove. So... <laughs> What a fun poem this is. Um, obviously, we don't see a dog, chickens, cows, or hay. We don't see the crops. We don't see the smokehouse. So there's this great backstory that's informing what is on the minds of the subject in, in uh, American Gothic. So it's, it's just, it's a lot of fun. And feel free to have fun with your writing. You should. <laughs> I just had an idea for thinking back to the last poem, how much fun it was as a puzzle. And the tone of this was light. Yes. But maybe our challenge for next time would be some people could come with one or two stanzas that they tried to do as the contrapuntal. Yeah. You know, just there just you go. Play. You could. Right. You know, you definitely could do that. Four, line, four lines, four lines, and that also work across. Yeah, dip our toe into it. I love it. That's great. Um, yeah, we'll go. We'll go into the next one. There we go. So this is one that's based on um, the life of uh, Cesar Chavez and uh, the writing of Robert Frost. So this is by John Sibley Williams, and it's a very interesting way that you might think of if you go back to the Grantwood Country Chronicle. What if you used uh, some of the poems or writings in there uh, as the basis for something else that you're going to write? So in this one, you'll hear a little bit. I, I'm not going to read this one again because I don't want to take up too much time. But um, if, if we can have this posted, you can read it. And it's just a, a really very cool idea of, of how to weave these these two stories and how to read uh, weave some of the language in uh of robert frost which i think is just it's very uh very clever and it, it's a powerful poem we'll, we'll move on to the next one yes indeed so other examples Here's one, um, A Bod with Burning City, I'm going to mention, by Ocean Vong from the Poetry Foundation. These links work if you're interested in looking that. A Bod with Burning City is about the exit from um, Saigon or Ho Chi Minh City of uh, the military back in the 70s. And it's set to the lyrics of White Christmas. White Christmas was a code that was used a radio code to let people know that uh, that the Americans were pulling out. Ocean Vong is of Vietnamese descent, and this is a very personal poem to him. Um, I don't know if we'd have time to hear it. We we might not, but you could. Do you want to give it a shot? It's a okay. There we go. Oh, no.
There it is. Oh, bye. Can, with burning can, city. Can you scroll at the same time? Milk oh, flower petals on the street, like pieces of a girl's dress. May your days be merry and bright. He fills a teacup with champagne, brings it to her lips. Open, he says. She opens. Outside, a soldier spits out his cigarette as footsteps fill the square like stones fallen from the sky. May all your Christmases be white as the traffic guard unstraps his holster, his hand running the hem of her white dress, his black eyes, her black hair, a single candle, their shadows, two wicks. A military truck speeds through the intersection, the sound of children shrieking inside, a bicycle hurled through a store window. When the dust rises, a black dog lies in the road, panting, its hind legs crushed into the shine of a white Christmas. On the nightstand, a sprig of magnolia expands like a secret heard for the first time. The treetops glisten and children listen. The chief of police face down in a pool of Coca-Cola, a palm-sized photo of his father soaking beside his left ear. The song moving through the city like a widow, a white, a white. I'm dreaming of a curtain of snow falling from her shoulders. Snow crackling against the window. Snow shredded with gunfire. Red sky. Snow on the tanks rolling over the city walls. A helicopter lifting the living just out of reach. The city so white it is ready for ink. The radio saying run, run, run. Milk flower petals on a black dog, like pieces of a girl's dress. May your days be merry and bright. She is saying something neither of them can hear. The hotel rocks beneath them, the bed a field of ice cracking. Don't worry, he says, as the first bomb brightens their faces. My brothers have won the war, and tomorrow the lights go out. I'm dreaming, I'm dreaming, to hear sleigh bells in the snow. In the square below, a nun on fire runs silently toward her god. Open. He says, she opens. Yes, this is a very intense poem. And <laughs> I, I realized, you know, kind of countered with the fun of the Grandwood poem. That's, uh, you know, a little bit uh, startling. But I wanted you to see how um, uh, Ocean Vong treated the um, lyrics of the song, how he used it italics with them. Uh, and I also think it's always a treat to just hear the poet read uh, his or her own work. I just, I think that's very powerful. But um, just if you, you can see the way that the story, a uh, different story came in uh, with those lyrics that, you know, we all know and love from White Christmas. It's got a very peaceful and traditional feeling and family feeling for uh, many of us. And it just, it, it was the treatment that story he wove through was, was uh, absolutely different. So we'll go on to the next one. Thank you, Elaine, for playing that.
And I just wanted to show you where you can find some really good examples of other ekphrastic writing, uh, which includes actually prose. The ekphrastic Review is a great place to go. Uh, they publish poetry, fiction, microfiction, uh, and it's just, it's so fascinating if you're really wanting to see, okay, I'm a fiction writer, how, how is, are these pieces treated and uh, what can, it, does it help you get an idea? We'll go on to the next one. Another place too is uh, Rattle and the Eric Frostic Challenge. Uh, you can look that one up on Facebook. Um, so you'll see they always have a, a new challenge out there about every six weeks or so. So you can see what they're doing. That's it's always cool to see what how other people are writing. You can go into the next. And I'm just I would suggest an in-person emotional experience because that's what it can be. I'm going to have you sh uh, click uh, on this. So this is uh, <laughs> Saint John the Baptist by Caravaggio. Uh, this is something that I had an opportunity to see down in Kansas City when I went down there following my cyclones uh, in the Big Eight or the Big Ten, or Big Twelve um, basketball tournament, and lo and behold, they lost the first round. So what do you do? My son said, "I know where we can see a Caravaggio in person." So we did that, and uh, once you click on the next one, uh, the dimensions of this. Oh, let's go back. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's a huge painting. It, it, there's nothing like standing before a 12 and a half foot by 16 by 6 uh, painting um, to really help you feel dwarfed and small and notice the shadows, the darkness, the light. Um, this was uh, painted in 1608. It was jaw dropping to be in front of it and to know that this was commissioned for a family chapel. Um, you know, ending up in Kansas City, it's a very long and fascinating story that I won't share here, but I would say if you have an opportunity to go and visit uh, some of the Grant Wood art that we are talking about, some of it is enormous, it's huge, um, and just it, take that into consideration as you are writing your pieces. Sure, it's fun to look at these things on a, on a screen, but sometimes our screen are no bigger than a phone, right? Our screen. So if there's a way that you can arrange to, to visit some of the, the pieces uh, in person, it's it will change your perspective. We'll move on. So Elaine talked about next time. So just kind of, I want you to think about um, what, what kind of a prompt you might use? Do you, are you really, you know, I want to do visual, I want to do literary, maybe something else already, uh, written, uh, about, uh, Grant Wood and some of the, the, uh, his work. Is, is there any music out there that you want to respond to? Make music of the time? Um, so I include food because last year I was totally inspired, um, by the Grant Wood Country uh, cookbooks. There are three of them out there. Oh my goodness. And I had a ball. And did you know Grant Wood has recipes in there and he's really famous for his mashed potatoes. So um, maybe that's a prompt that you might respond to. I realize it's, nah, is it art? Mm, I guess uh, beauty or art is in the eye of the beholder. But just think about where you start that conversation with art. Consider your approach your, to the conversation. Are you inside the artist's mind? Are you a character or an object in the painting? Um, what is your reaction to form, whether it's visual uh, forms or technique, whether it's a literary form like a contrapuntal? I'm going to be bringing in um, sonnet form. I know some of you are very familiar with that. Also some triolets, uh, which is kind of an old uh, French form. It's an eight line, uh, really interesting form. Um, also, uh, just in different uh, quatrain um, rhyme schemes. Um, and I know Elaine is going to talk a little bit about prose writing and uh, doing some essay writing. 
So that will be uh, wonderful. Uh, but maybe there's, you know, kind of a visual technique that you're responding to, whether it's, you know, maybe there's color, maybe, uh, maybe it's the way corn is painted or the trees. Oh my goodness, the trees. Yes. So, uh, and you can also write in the voice of a persona from a particular time or culture or gender. Um, how does that persona react to the work? Uh, how are you part of an experience? Or maybe you actually go through the experience of preparing the Grant Wood mashed potatoes. Uh, maybe, you know, you, you serve them at a, a special dinner that's, you know, celebrating art. Uh, maybe you go to the American Gothic house and you have that experience. Maybe you uh, imagine watching the artist. Uh, maybe you actually go to a gallery and you're watching visitors um, react to a Grant Wood. Maybe your visitor and, and others are around you reacting. So there's a lot of ways to really, you know, open your mind uh, and open your preparedness as a writer uh, to start uh, thinking about these things. So that's it. And if you have any questions, <laughs> you can put them in the chat or just, you know, ask them here, but I don't want to take up too much time. Oh, Thank you so much, Dawn. Um, you gave us a lot to chew on, and I'm hoping in this next section too. I'm going what what I'm going to be presenting here as some context um, might help spur piggyback on the poetry or the writing things that uh, Dawn presented, and just like see if you find some rabbit holes to go down. Yeah, you know. and I was going to mention too, with some of the forms that I bring in, um, I, I have this wonderful book that I just found accidentally, which is where all one, how all wonderful books are discovered, I think, is uh, it's a very old book. It was written in the late 30s. It has a front piece by Grant Wood, and it's, um, it's, Iowa writers, and a lot of them write poetry. And I'm going to bring in uh, just to show you some of the forms of the time. So I'll have an image of here's this poem from this this very old book of the time, and uh, then just talk a little bit about how that form is is actually received uh, or is is written. So anyway, that that will be fun in terms of time and place. Right, right, and so. Again, the point is, is, is um, you could start writing immediately if you're inspired after this. Um, if you feel like you want to write something, but you still have some questions, feel free to reach out to Don or me um, via email. Um, and just so, any, and I should probably put that in the chat. Put those, put those addresses. We should sure. probably do that, uh, Don, before the night's over. Um, sure. Does anybody have anything they'd like to say or questions or comments before I launch into my whirlwind broad brush tour of some things? <laughs> well, thanks again for the opportunity. All right. So kind of like I mentioned, um, we're centering some of our presentations kind of heavily on some some things related to women. And so I called my, my uh, presentation here, The Perfect Woman, Idle Wives, and, um, and Nan, Women and Others in Cultural Context During the Grant Wood Era. So I'm doing, I'm centering some things on some of this women stuff, and, but then I'm going, I'm going off on some, some other areas as well. So, and so you'll see. And this book is literally, it's from 1903. There's copies of it in the Smithsonian. So this is a book that was in was all over the country, guiding people, um, women in particular, um, you know, on how to keep home. And so, uh, perfect womanhood that was a thing. Went women on the pedestal. Um, and so I just, you know, why why have why are we journeying to the past? That's one of the one of the things. I one of the reasons I'm doing this presentation is because I really feel like since we didn't live there, though some of us probably have family and heard lots of stories, um, 
we can't, pop, I, I want to give us a sense of how to feel what was going on there. Certain constraints, certain social norms, certain expectations, uh, so that we could feel that and kind of check ourselves as we go in terms of, you know, what can we realistically interpret and say about the past when we didn't live there? Um, so yes, it was published in 1903. Grant Wood would have been 12 years old. Nan would have been four at the time this was published. And uh, in the in the preface to this book, it says men may rule the way the race, but uh, women <laughs> women govern its destiny. Um, and I am going to actually there we go. I'm I'm gonna share this way so that I can read the whole screen. Uh, uh, women's, women's labors and success in the various fields and affairs of life are, are calling daily for more and more attention. While we admire her in her new role with her efforts towards success in society, literature, science, politics, and the arts, we must not lose sight of her most divine and sublime mission in life womanhood and motherhood and so um that is the preface to this to this book so how, how it's orienting uh women in relation to all the tips and tricks for conducting her her life child rearing marriage health beauty all of it um you know obviously there were some patriarchal norms dating back thousands of years but there'll be more we'll talk a little bit more about that later um, in the book, which is fascinating, again, we're in 1903, you know, that there was no internet, you know, there were barely, there were barely, uh, vehicles, um, warning to both, and, and this is going to speak to kind of some, some attitudes about personal matters. Um, I'm jumping down to the, uh, the bottom there it says great men of all times have traced their lofty ideals and talents and indeed the whole of their success to their mothers a mother's influence both on body and mind and her powers of transmission of habits good or bad are many times stronger than those of the father and so we do know that uh, hattie wood grant wood's mother and nan wood's mother definitely played a major role in acknowledging and cultivating young grant wood's artistic talents so that's well, that's well known. But um, just to show how kind of different sensibilities were then, there was a warning to both boys and girls to not debase yourself and become lower than the beasts of the field. Do not do it. Stop it now. Do not allow yourself to think about it. Give up evil associations, seek pure companions, and go to your mother, older sister, or physician for advice. And so teach your boys to shun all children who indulge in a loathsome, loathsome habit uh, of self-abuse or all children who talk about these things. The sin is terrible and is in fact worse than lying or stealing. It will ruin both the soul and the body. So to say that all things sexual were pretty, pretty um, constrained uh, would be an under would be an understatement, and this book is kind of uh, underscores that. And so, um, this is kind of prelude. To, well, we'll get to there. A little bit more about masculinity. Um, so, at the time, there were profound, tr and this is in the book Grant Wood: A Life by Trip Evans. So, I pulled uh, out a section from that that speaks to the profound transformations in raising of boys in the calibration of masculinity for men of all ages reached something of a crescendo in the decade of Wood's boyhood. At no other time in the nation's history, David Lubin writes, had males so much cause to worry about whether or not they were being male. Anxieties concerning the cultivation of true manhood crept even as far as the nursery, shaping cultural beliefs concerning the meaning of boys' patterns of play, how they learned, and even such mundane details as their color preferences, clothing, and speech. So, um, a lot of these things were not, you know, overtly spoken about. It was just kind of understood, part of the cultural milieu, as it were. Um, there was an, definitely an influence 
by Teddy Roosevelt. This is a picture of him at Montauk. And also in Trip Evans' book, he makes reference to, uh, in 1899, Roosevelt had declared, I feel we cannot too strongly insist upon the need for rough manly virtues in the education of boys. Interestingly, the Wood brothers, the three of them, age 14, 10, and eight, were described in the Anamosa General Eureka in 1901. Grant would have been 10. Must have been, you know, right before uh, their father died, before their father died and they ended up, you know, moving to Cedar Rapids. Uh, the Wood brothers, age 14, 10, and eight, were described as manly boys, strong and manly brothers, and strong young men upon whom the dear mother would lean. So we've got that. So why are we talking about this? Why am I talking about this and putting this context in place? Well, um, in particular, there was a charge of homosexuality was specifically recorded against Grant Wood while teaching at the University of Iowa. And so we're talking about kind of what, what was happening in terms of threat and legality. I'm getting into the weeds a little bit more so we can feel how constrained this was. Um, Grant Wood while teaching at the University of Iowa. Lester Longman, who was the administrator of the art department beginning 1936, uh, made the charge. Um, it, was, uh, it was even referenced in a thinly veiled way when Longman was quoted in an article in Time magazine you see, therefore, that Mr. Wood's personal persuasions have nothing whatever to do with our granting his leave of absence. Uh, according to Joni Kinsey, current professor of American art at U of I, homosexuality, of course, was the one accusation in 1940 that could have ruined Wood's reputation merely by implication. It's important to note that Longman had known and had known and had known and profound artistic differences with Grant Wood and his provincial popularity, you know, artistic snobbery, anyone, or at least profound artistic differences, okay? There was an internal scandal at U of I and Wood was eventually removed from Longwood's supervision in June of 1941. So he spent that summer in Clear Lake, painted productively and returned to Iowa City with new optimism. But tragically, he was diagnosed uh, in October of 41 and died in February of 42. Um, so there, so that's kind of, I would encourage you to find that article by Joni Kinsey uh, about this scandal. It's very illuminating. Um, she, oh, when did she put that out? Uh, I think it was about 2012. Um, somewhere around there. Oh, 2000. She, she did a lot of speaking on this topic between the years 2005 and 2012. And uh, so also uh, kind of an interesting aside is that um, during a discussion of Wood's Sultry Night, which if some of you are not familiar with that piece, it's a full frontal nude of a male. Um, uh, visiting professor Anya Ventura indicated that though conservative conservatives once proposed an amendment prohibiting gay marriage be renamed the American Gothic Amendment. I didn't know that. That was new to me. Um, more than a little irony there. The couple depicted in the painting is not even a heterosexual couple. It's a, it's a daughter and intended to be a daughter and father. So, so there's kind of all that sort of thing happening and getting muddled up with, with each other. So um, I do have a book recommendation uh, that I referenced when I was putting this together out of the past, uh, the gay and lesbian history from 1869 to present. That's a good one. And just again, to feel what was, what was happening during Grant Wood's life in Iowa? Well, the Iowa ter territory was organized in 1838, received its laws from Wisconsin territory which included a penalty of up to three years for prison, in prison for sodomy, which they received from the Michigan Territory. So in 1840, Iowa rejected all laws from Michigan and Wisconsin. So for a while, there was, there was uh, uh, nothing happening. And in 1843, Iowa passed its first criminal code with no mention. Um, but then enter the Victorian era of 
1892, and a statute was enacted criminalizing sodomy with punishment of one to 10 years imprisonment possible. Um, they expanded the laws in 1904. Uh, they passed a law in 1907 permitting youthful first-time offenders to carry out their punishment in the state reformatory rather than the penitentiary. But the exceptions were for sodomy, incest, murder, and treason. So to the penitentiary you go. In 1911, um, the inmates at state institutions were inspected by law to see if they'd be candidates for sterilization. And in 1913, uh, those candidates for sterilization were expanded to include criminals, rapists, idiots, feeble-minded, imbeciles, lunatics, drunkards, drug fiends, epileptics, syphilit, um, oh, I misspelled that, syphilit, people with syphilis, moral and sexual perverts, and diseased and degenerate persons. So there you have that. In 1925, Iowa Supreme Court rejected drunkenness as a defense to the charge of sodomy. Okay. In 1929, sterilization laws were rewritten to include due process because they had run into uh, constitutionality issues. By 1948, 891 Iowans had been sterilized, 6% for reasons other than insanity and mental retardation. Um, and noteworthy. Fast forward to 1955, during the kidnap and murder of a boy in Sioux City, uh, in the Sioux City area, it led to the mass detention of all known gay men in the area, and 29 were sent to asylums with no conviction of a crime. So, just to give it context all the way to the, to the current day, in 1976, the divided Iowa Supreme Court ruled that it would not criminalize sodomy among heterosexuals and 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 then one month later the court established an age of consent to 16. 1977 they finally uh, repealed the sterilization law 2009 same-sex marriage legalized in iowa and december 13th of this past year 2022 the defense of marriage act was repealed and replaced by respect for marriage act which recognizes and protects same-sex and interracial marriages under federal law so that is you know i think i think we can't do the times justice if we didn't we, if we don't know that this was an understood what these understood threats were lurking at the time so when we're interpreting what's happening and we may be assigning, excuse me, our own sensibilities to what we're seeing. We might want to think how much that this was going on and it was just understood to be the reality of life. So um, there has been a lot of discussion among some of us in the forum about NAN and the lack of records related to Grant's um, almost certain homosexuality. Did she burn them? Um, I mean, after all, she had a great memory and kept copious scrapbooks, but it makes complete sense to me that she would not address her, her brother's sexuality in any public or documented way. And this group can continue to talk about these dynamics if they like. Having said that, I think it's completely appropriate for there to be discussions about interpretations of his art in relation to the images and subject choices, or lack thereof, that speak most certainly to Grant Wood's sexual identity. though identity wasn't even probably a word or a thing back there then either you just lived with the constraints around you whatever those norms were you navigated around those and you dealt with it and you certainly didn't speak openly about matters of sexuality um it just you know you, you just culturally you just didn't do it um so Moving on from that, that reality uh, of the times, um, being, I'm reminding us that the Woods did have Quaker roots. And what kind of what does that mean a little bit? And so I just wanted to share kind of what, because I think it's instructive as to kind of Wood had, a, Grant Wood had a, had a pretty expansive progressive mind. He was very, renaissance man like in spite of coming to a point where he focused on certain sub you know rural 
Iowa subjects more than the the Paris things when he was taking his trips. Um, according to this book, it it quoted Quaker fundamental ideas mean that men cannot think clearly when they are ill, angry, or afraid. To condition children by teaching without at the same time developing their critical faculties so that they question what they are taught is to turn them into slaves. Friends, therefore, believe that they must overcome poverty, disease, fear, injustice, and prejudice, and that to work for these ends is part of true religion. Friends believe, in short, that religion is something that has to be put into practice. Friends realize, of course, that freedom has a social as well as political significance in practice, just as it has a mental as well as physical meaning. Men or women bound by poverty to a life of continual toil and meet living in constant fear of unemployment are not more free <coughs> excuse me, than the men who can be bought and sold. And of course, we know about the Quakers and their, their uh, ongoing uh, work with the abolitionist movement. And so that is part of, of Grant Wood's upbringing. And that would just be kind of an is for him, the understanding of kind of uh, some of those, re some of those ideas and approaches. Now, at the same time, Sigmund Freud's ideas became very popular in America and were influenced by physicians and psychiatry across the nation. His, the dates that he lived was 1856 to 1939. And I bring this up because I'm circling back to women, the constraints on women. So, you know, when I think of, uh, I've been thinking a lot about just Grant Wood and Nan. I've been thinking about his gay identity, her constraints as a woman of that time, and just how those two kind of constraints and oppressions kind of had to live with each other. Um, and one of them, uh, one of the things was just this, this persistence, this idea of, of um, you know, just what, what is a woman? And so in 2006, this, a very interesting book was written, Misogyny, the World's Oldest Prejudice. And Freud's description of female development echoed not only that of African witch doctors, but also the view of Aristotle, who saw females as mutilated males, creatures that failed to realize their full potential. This established, established a duality, meaning male is normal, female abnormal. Additionally, Hitler blamed Jewish intellectuals for women trying to assert their rights, even characterizing the movement as a sinister plot against motherhood. So look at all these little rivulets that just kind of all converge in, in kind of all these, these, these social norms and constraints and ideas that just kind of seep in. And uh, according to this author, it's a really neat book, uh, misogyny can be summed up in four words, pervasive, persistent, uh, subtly harmful, and changeable, according to whims of the times. So I'm going to, um, excuse me, lighten this up a little bit here. Um, and as I was looking for kind of like, well, what was going on with um, the demographics and what kind of, I, was, I was actually looking for birth of a nation and whether it came to Des Moines, I mean, excuse me, uh, Cedar Rapids, and it certainly did. And uh, instead I found that this uh, silent movie, was being shown based on a novel by James Oppenheim, and it really had rave reviews at the time in Cedar Rapids. Um, and you can actually, this, this film is actually archived um, in the Library of Congress, and it's taught in film schools, and, but only two of seven reels exist. And so there is a link that you can go online and you can watch it. And and apparently this was the play that lifted the curtains of society's glass house. And it was also significant because there, there was a woman who co-wrote and directed it um, uh, as well. And it was based on a novel, uh, by a very long novel by James Oppenheim. And <laughs> it says here that Idle Wives is the finest object lesson I have ever seen. It portrays life from every conceivable phase. 
a person who would not recommend this picture would be a traitor to mankind. <laughs> and uh, let me see here if I can get, oh, I can't, let me see if I can get closer, closer in to, to read, read this, uh, what is actually said in the Gazette. Idle wives at the Strand isn't the kind of picture you are thinking of. It is much better. It is in many ways the most human picture that has ever been shown in Cedar Rapids. It does not deal with pretty faces nor million dollar year actresses, but it deals with human, uh, ah, not sure what the events. It is the panorama of life in the modern city and under present conditions, 1916. It is a panoramic as the birth of a nation in that it presents the world of pictures unfolding from a reel. And it's really much more worth worthwhile than the birth of a nation picture, which was essentially untrue to history and more or less untrue to life. Well, this one is true to the history of human life, everyday life. So I found that pretty fascinating. Uh, so. Uh, we're going to just, let me see what time it is. Oh, I got to hurry. Uh, we're going to take a jaunt through a few slides of, from this movie. There's Mr. and Mrs. Jameson representing husbands and wives who are drifting apart. There's Mary Wells representing two girls who rebel against home restraint. <laughs> the Smith family represents two working poverty and toil blind you to your many blessings. Apparently it's, anyway. Alberta Davies and a little of her unfortunate past uh, from reading the synopsis, I think uh, she ends up pregnant. And then this sign says, working girls, are you thinking you would be happy, happier away from home restraint? Husbands and wives, are you drifting apart? Young men, are you useful citizens or are you a menace to society? Working men and women, is your home today the home you dreamed it would be? So it's kind of, they put this uh, film together as almost a movie within a movie. And then here's another kind of interesting one. In the nursery, the imported governess was scientifically bringing up the children to do without their parents. <laughs> oh, goodness. So. That kind of came, brings up this overview of what was happening in the lives of women legally in the Grant Wood era. Well, coverture was a thing. A lot of people don't know that word, but this is what it means. By marriage, the husband and wife are one person in law. That is, the very being or legal existence of the woman is suspended during the marriage, or at least is incorporated and consolidated into that of the husband. Under whose wing, protection and cover, she performs everything and is under the protection and influence of her husband, her baron or lord. Husbands and wives are one legal entity. A woman does not legally exist. She is covered by her husband and before him, her father. The founding fathers relied heavily upon this uh, English common law, which had dated back over 600 years. Women couldn't own or inherit property, keep the wages they earned, or make wills. Everything a woman had belonged to her husband. Um, this law reinforced social norms, uh, reinforcing the belief that women were unequal to men, therefore becoming acceptable to believe that women needed men to protect and provide. Therefore, most girls received little or no education, and most women lacked the training to pursue a profession. Many women had to work anyway with their husbands controlling their wages and coverture made it difficult for women to escape society's expectations about what they could and couldn't do. It still does. Over time, aspects of coverture have disappeared. I will insert, from my discussions uh, with, a, with a, um, a therapist friend of mine, African-American woman, we actually had a discussion about some of this sort of thing a few years ago. And she reminded me, she goes, this, this whole situation of, you know, women being protected and the fair, frail um, woman who is revered and on a pedestal and swoons and all that, that's a white woman's experience because she reminds us that a lot of African-American families were 
ripped apart. Their families were literally dismantled during uh, slave times. And it has taken a long time for the family, for nuclear families to get back together. Um, and so the women, uh, so this notion of men protecting the women was essentially absent. Black women learned to be very independent of anyone else. So that, that intricate dance of dependency was a little bit different in the African American community. Not for everyone, but it's a, a very real dynamic. So that was an interesting perspective at the time that I got it. Um, so uh, just a little quick scan of what some of the legal legalities were, legal constraints were during the Grant Wood era. Uh, in 1839, Mississippi became the first state to pass a law guaranteeing married women the right to receive income from property they owned. Um, in 1920, of course, women got the right to vote. Black women did not. Um, or excuse me. Um, black men got the right to vote in 1870. Uh, but uh, black women didn't get the right to vote until all women got the right to vote. Um, so that's a thing. Uh, in 1860, the FDA approved the first oral contraceptives. In 1975, Loretta Lynn released her song, The Pill, which was banned on over 60 radio stations. <laughs> I just had to throw that in because I thought it was interesting. Um, Iowa did ratify the ERA in 1972. However, it is not yet the law of the land, and discrimination is not prohibited in our Iowa Constitution currently. So there you have that. Of course, 1973 was Roe v. Wade. 1974, Congress gave women equal access to credit cards. So, coverture, uh, regardless of marital status. At, that, at this point, only the passage of an equal rights amendment would make women equal in the eyes of the law. So, in 1989, Iowa made marital rape illegal. So, think about that. Up to that point, it was legal. It would take until 1993 for all 50 states to illegalize it. And then, um, and as of uh, 2020, discrimination against women exists as evidenced by the sad fact that women are still paid 78 cents for every dollar paid to men. There are more than 200,000 women in Iowa living in poverty and women and children making make up 87% of the poor in Iowa. And that is as of 2020. So that is kind of a broad stroke of, again, constraints. That's the world that Nan lived in. Kind of fast forward to now, kind of where we have come. Uh, so that's your overview there. Um, uh, one of the things, uh, and I probably will skip this, but there's, there's some really interesting things out there about, uh, from science, from, uh, what's the, publication. I think it's called New Science. Uh, and this is this is from um, the Jane Goodall Research Center, why egalitarian societies died out. Because essentially until about 5,000 years ago, um, you know, societies, you know, uh, had this kind of egalitarian system and patriarchal si systems didn't start until about, until about 5,000 years ago. And those systems relied on stratification. And that's when class distinctions happened. And that's when the idea of maintaining those stratifications by force happened. So, so organizing societies and get, having a conqueror's mentality, it wasn't always the way of human life. And so they make the point here that, that although dominant dominance hierarchies may have had their origins in ancient primate social behavior, we human primates are not stuck with an evolutionarily determined survival of the fittest social structure. We can assume that because inequality exists, we cannot assume that because inequality exists, it is somehow beneficial. So the person writing this for the Jane Goodall Research Center just said, that basically, if people make systems, people can unmake them. And so there's a, a rich history behind how we got to this point. And so there you have that. So what about Nan? So 
this was Nan, that was Nan's world. That was Grant's world. You have had kind of a sense of the tone and and the, the constraints they were under. And uh, I really love the introduction to her book by Wanda Corn. I think it I think it tells some neat things. And because of this, you know, kind of lack of options, um, she really made hay, as it were, with her. Uh, in a very genuine way, uh, she genuinely loved her brother. was was grateful to him. Um, wanted to share in the joy of the artfulness, and so one of the things said in this um, in the foreword by uh, Wanda Corn is that as the female model for American Gothic, she lived in the limelight of the picture's fame. This suited her just fine. She would disarm reporters when they asked her what it felt like to be a stern and decidedly non-glamorous legend. Her brother, she always responded, had given her the best gift of all, a rich and eventful life, never refusing an invitation to be photographed in front of the painting or a reproduction of it. She would strike the old chestnut pose so quickly and so completely that it turned everyone present upside down in glee. If Grant gave Nan a full life, she gave him and his memory the most dedicated service. The kind of art Wood made figurative storytelling dealing with rural themes had been in perfect stride with national sentiments during the Depression years. But by World War II, what he suddenly came, what when he suddenly came under attack, uh, oh, but by World War II, uh, his art had suddenly come under attack for its alleged folky folksiness, narrow vision, illustrative quality, and regional celebration. But as Nan says at the end of her memoir, he was, he was called just about everything, satirist, liberal, socialist, fascist, communist, isolationist, and flag waver. But now the tide has turned and Grant Wood, along with other figurative artists of the 1930s, has found a place in the history books as one of the country's most inventive regionalist artists. And I think that's just a, a wonderful a way to think of, of this whole continuum. It's been a fascinating journey into Grant Wood's life and out of it through the eyes and experience of Nan as well. So we have this really long experience that we can roll around in. And I dare say it's why this forum, there could be no end in sight. There's just so many rabbit holes we can go down and continue to go down. And we'll go down many of them in the next seven or eight weeks. Uh, a nod to a couple of things in case you're interested in going down rabbit holes. This book, Outside In, really does talk a lot about the racist history in Iowa and just the experience in general. It's a very rich book. And, um, uh, and I kind of touched on that. What There was a very interesting story. There's a very interesting story in this book about a, a statewide debate that was held in Cedar Rapids in 1905. And um, it's just a really great read. And it references um, just all kinds of kind of famous people in Iowa and in the world of African American studies. So if you have a notion, check out Outside In. It's a wonderful book. Um, <coughs> another resource I think is neat for just context, and I, and Paul, I think I know you, you know Dorothy uh, Schweider, I think you told me, um, had worked with her, and she's written so many wonderful things, um, and I really love some of, I, I really like this book, because it's just an easy read. You could just pick it up and you just know lots of things about Iowa. And one of them for the time period of Grant Wood was the, the largest foreign born groups in Iowa as of, of 1900 when Grant Wood was 10. And obviously Germans were more, by and large more than anybody. And then the Swedish, Irish, Norwegians, English, about the same amount, Danes. Canada, Austria, Netherlands, Bohemia. So there's that on the demographics. Um, if you want more on demographics, there's some neat links regarding how Native nations migrated to Iowa and out of Iowa. 
And um, there's a site here that talks about the Jewish population, how it came to be from various countries here in Iowa. Um, so there's a lot out there. Um, and so I'm going to stop talking now. And um, if anybody's got any questions or comments, we got just a couple minutes left. And this whole thing is to be continued. So <laughs> for the, in the weeks to come, and we will so look forward to the 23rd when we have Sean Ulmer of Cedar Rapids Museum of Art and Akari Nicely of the American Gothic House. That's going to be exciting. So. When you did the chronological um, laws against uh, homosexuality, uh, you did mention that in 1955, uh, there were, had been a child uh, murdered in Sioux City, uh -huh. and there was a group of men that were arrested and sent to asylums. Uh -huh. Well, some years ago, I went to Prairie Lights, and an author had done a, 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 a book um, based on facts that surrounded that whole situation. But what was of great interest to it is those men, and I can't recall exactly how many men there were, maybe 15 to 20, uh, they didn't really know what to do with them after they arrested them because they seemed quite normal. And there, uh, later it was found out that the boy uh, had been killed by a, a family member or, or some other person. But they were all sent to Mount Pleasant where they had a mental health institute or an institution for the insane, insane at that time. Well, after the men arrived, uh, this author put together the story and the men, it was a, a dreary, awful spot, um, as you can imagine, an asylum in 1955. But the men uh, started to ask whether or not they could paint so they began to paint some of the walls of cells um, and everything perked up a lot. They were nice pastel colors that the men chose. Um, then they decided that they would pump music through the uh, asylum and everybody started to feel good. The workers all seemed to like to go to work now. Everything was going well. Um, so then the men decided every Friday they would have a tea party um, and uh, they would invite in local residents. Evidently, the gymnasium had some kind of a, an area up above where uh, people of Mount Pleasant could come, and they danced with the other inmates. There was a rule that two men couldn't dance together. You had to pick out one of the women inmates um, to, to dance with, um, but everything was going nicely until the state decided, well, nothing seems to be wrong with these men. Of course, they had ruined their careers back in Sioux City, so the men couldn't go back to Sioux City because of the stigma there, and many went to California. But as soon as they left the asylum in Mount Pleasant, again, it started to be the dreary place it had been uh, before they came. I think the book is called Sioux City Sex Crimes. Maybe it's a paperback book. Uh, the, uh, the, not, uh, the writer was from the East, and really a pleasant guy. I talked to him a little bit afterwards and I said, well, this sounds like the kind of a story that would be a really good movie. He <laughs> said it had been bought up at that time, but um, I've never seen the movie, so I don't think it's ever been been taken. But I just wanted to, to throw that out because I think the listeners might enjoy that story. Yeah, absolutely. And Joe, thank you for posting. The book was Sex, Crime, Panic by Neil yeah. Miller. Is that, does that sound right? Yep. Thanks, Joe. And yeah, there's been quite a, quite a few comments in the chat. If you guys want to look through that, there's, a, um, yeah, yeah. We're just, just really kind of throwing a lot of things at the wall at this session. And so we'll get down into more specifics next, next time. And, uh, and, and that'll be fun to, to hear what you all think about what you hear from Sean Ulmer and Kari Nicely. That'll be, that'll be neat. And, uh, and like I said, oh, here's a question. I wonder at what point American Gothic morphed into this iconic symbol copied all over the place. Um, it got famous pretty quickly because of it winning the prize in Chicago, right? It was pretty quick I and, uh, in fact, people started copying it right away, and that's why uh, Nan and Grant 
decided that he had to, uh, they didn't have the copyright rules that they have today. And so he started uh, any painting after that, having a picture of himself taken of it in the, uh, in his studio next to the unfinished painting so that they could tell that he was actually the artist and nobody else could get credit or copy it and send it around. Thanks everybody for hanging in there. And thanks so much. I mean, I, I feel like we just, just stuffed so much in today and we can revisit all these things and people can come back and ask questions later. And, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get the, we'll keep going and going and going. And uh, so have a great couple weeks. And if you, if you're so inclined, go do some of your own research on some things and, and come back and, and share what you might have found. Um, we'll try to find some time for that chatting as well, because that's the point of some of this. So uh, we'll just, we'll just keep making space for that. So um, unless anybody has anything else, I think we better, better sign off. So thanks for a great presentation well thank you so much everybody for uh for being here and it's just great to to do this again in the winter months take care everybody <laughs> <laughs>